and um, I have a special guest today. Her name is Movita Johnson Worrell, and she is here to discuss with us her personal experience with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So Movita, if you could um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm a 48-year-old wife and mother and grandmother. Um, and for a large part of my life, I experienced a lot of traumatic events, uh, beginning from a very early age. Okay, so that's been something that has been recurring for you? Yeah, uh, well, it started when I was around eight years old, um, and I spent a lot of time trying to recover from that trauma, and then several years ago, I was re-traumatized again. Could you go into a little bit more detail about your experience? Sure. Um, on March 30th, 1975, it was Easter Sunday. Um, my stepfather was murdered in front of me. And it created, it, it created a new world for me, a world that I didn't feel comfortable in anymore. Um, I, I became an introvert. And even as a young child, I began to isolate. And I wound up um, self-medicating to deal with um, the trauma. I, I would get uh, these dreams where I would see my dad in a coffin and the coffin would rise. And sometimes these things happened when I was asleep and sometimes they also happened when I was awake. Um, I, I would cry for no reason at all. I felt a sense of abandonment that I carried for a lot of years um, and it took me about 30 years to recover from that to to come to a place where you know um, I was able to live with what had happened and not jump when I heard a loud noise or be fearful of the world or feel like I didn't like myself very much because I thought maybe it was something that I could do sure. to change the situation. Um, and as I said, I self-medicated for a lot of years and I wind up um, going into recovery and that helped me and I wound up going into therapy and that helped me. Um, and then three years ago, I was re-traumatized again. My 18-year-old son was murdered in a case of mistaken identity. And again my life changed so the gains that you had started making in a positive way then felt like you had just relapsed back to where you were it, it felt like i relapsed back to where i was but it felt even worse than that um because my life had finally gotten to a place where i was comfortable in the world mm -hmm. and i was okay with who i was and i was beginning to feel safe and when my son was murdered, my life changed forever. My world turned dark again. Um, the feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Um, I, would, I, I, I would have these recurring thoughts. Like, it was like a tape recorder mm -hmm. was in my mind. And everything that happened the night my son was murdered, because we spent that evening together, um, I remembered everything like from to what everybody had on, to everything that was said, to me kissing my son, to me praying when I left the house that he was gonna be safe. And it played like constantly in my oh, mind. Man, man. And I found myself, even in my car, I would get to a destination and not know how I got there. Um, I went from having this photographic memory where I didn't have to write every, anything down to having to write everything down and not remembering what I did five minutes ago. My social life was affected. My professional life was affected. My life with my family was different and was affected. So you were isolating. Mm -hmm. And so certainly from an early age, your life had changed. Yeah. And it changed forever who you were, your character, how you viewed the world. You felt no longer safe. And angry all the time. And angry. And angry all the time. Just Did you blame yourself or just I blame the myself. World? I blamed God. I blame the world. You know, I, I blame the people that 
killed my father and killed my son you know and even in between like it was my father in 1975 and then in 1991 my brother was murdered my only brother mm -hmm. you know and then in 2011 my son but when it happened with my son I remember how devastating it was you know sure, when my father child. was married but then when my son was murdered sure and it was a case of mistaken identity and I tried to keep him from going out that night. Did you have a premonition or? I don't know what it was, but I remember my husband and I do a lot of uh, work with people, like just helping people. And we had an event that night. And I remember asking my son and my daughter, my two sons and my daughter were together. My oldest is at the University of Maryland getting her PhD. So the three kids that are home, I remember asking them not to leave the house that night. I don't know what it was, but I asked them not to leave the house that night. And we had just bought my daughter a car and the three kids came into the room and I got off the bed and I kissed my son. And I said, Charles Johnson, do you know how much your mom loves you? And we had this whole conversation and we were laughing and joking. And I even remember trying to get the keys from him. Hmm. And we used to have this thing, our house is like a maze, and we used to have this thing where I would chase him through the house. And he wanted me to chase him through the house this night, so I'm chasing him through the house, and I'm trying to get the keys. And I go outside, and I know nothing about cars. Mm -hmm. And I try and unhook the hood of the car, not even knowing what I'm doing. Right. So I think maybe it was a premonition. Yeah. And I meant to tell my husband to unplug something in the car, and just that fast, I forgot. So I went through some guilt, because I felt like I could have stopped him from right. going out that night, right. you know. Um, but when that happened with my son, my, my life turned, my world turned dark again. You know, even though I'm three and a half years into this, I've not been able to regain myself yet. Right. right. You know, I'm trying to um, reinvent myself because I know I'm not the same person that I right. used to be. And I know I have to live in this world, but some days are still so dark. Right. Yeah. Now, Mavita, um, you discussed some of the symptoms that you were experiencing or are experiencing mm -hmm. to this day. So our viewers are um, a little bit more aware of what symptoms of PTSD are. Um, let's discuss some of these. You mentioned reliving mm -hmm. the event or certain events leading um, up to your son's death or um, the witnessing of your father. Mm -hmm. And that's something that still occurs. It is. Um, with the issue with my father, I don't experience that anymore. But the issue with my son, I relive the night that he was shot. Um, I relive when he was in surgery and I relive when they took me up to see him. He passed away in surgery and I begged them to let me see my son and they took me upstairs and I relive seeing him on the slab. Um, and those are very intrusive thoughts or yeah, that come up every day? It, I, I, I think about that night every day. Um, sometimes when I'm driving down the street, it becomes so overwhelming that I have to pull my car over um, just to get through the moment. And are there times when you have flashbacks as if you were at the hospital and they seem so real to you? Yes. How about um, nightmares? You said that that's something that... Yeah, I, with, with my father, I had nightmares for years. And you were very young. And I was, so. I was young. I yeah. was eight years old. Right. Um, I had those nightmares for years. With my son, I don't have nightmares. Um, I think I've dreamt about my son twice since he's been deceased. And one of the times was actually him standing in the room. Um, he was shot in the car and got out of the car. So I think that's kind of that kind of goes along with that. But my issue with my sleep is that I sleep really hard, but I never feel rested. So you feel like you're in a deep sleep. And yeah. Your dreams are very vivid. Yeah, I have very vivid dreams. But then, in, during the day, you're fatigued. As I, if you I wake slept up at all. fatigued. Okay. 
I, w I wake up feeling fatigued um, physically and emotionally, and my body even aches. So you're just mentally and physically drained throughout the day? Every day. And it's like no rest ever? Yeah. And then the work that I do, because I, I care for people um, that are chronically mentally ill, and, and I do consultation work and training, so my schedule is pretty fast-paced, um, and I find myself pushing myself even more to just try and get through the day and get as much done as I can. And some days I feel like I do so much, but nothing has yeah. been productive during the course of the day right. and 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 things have lapsed as a result of the PTSD um, I found myself in a position more recently where my house went into foreclosure and went up for share of sale and when when it first occurred and they sent my check back I, I, I didn't understand why are they sending my check right. back and they said they hadn't received three payments. And I'm like, that's crazy. I've been sending the mortgage off. Right. So what happens is because I have three homes that I care for and I pay the bills once a month, mm -hmm. I went in my bill bag and there were bank checks in the envelope with the stamp on them. Not mail. That had not went out in the mail. So you've just got so much stuff going on in your head. Yeah. That it's just It's really hard for me to focus Sure. now on anything and my family I, I, I feel so bad I love my family so much and I feel so bad because they get the worst part of me because that's where I'm most comfortable sure. and even my three grands my two grandsons I had three grandchildren the year my son died and my grandsons have been saying to me recently they're three year old three year olds and they say to me are you mad at me Jetta? I say, no, why do you ask that? You sound mad, Jedi. Mm. And it's making me realize that I'm sounding angry right, right. all the time. Right, so you find yourself irritable a lot because of so much stuff going on. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you startle easily or you seem hypervigilant. Can you go into a little bit more details regarding that? Um, I see flashes of light and they startle me, loud noises startle me. Um, and it's just like, I have to be a, aware of my surroundings or I go into a fight or flight mode. So I, I've gotten to the point where I have to pay attention or I can become startled mm -hmm. and want to flee. Okay. Um, so I just have to be more aware. So you kind of survey the room yeah. initially. How about, um, crowds are you a little bit more wary of crowds or I, i'm i'm pretty okay in crowds because of the work that i do and i'm usually around people and i'm i'm in the homes of the people that i support so i'm usually around a lot of people it's typically new surroundings okay. when i go to new places sure that i have to be aware and how about um interaction with family or friends do you find that you feel cut off or distant from them do you have a numbing feeling um more recently i have a numbing feeling and a hopeless feeling and a lot of times i don't say anything i i, I can isolate with my family and with my friends and I'm really really blessed to have a wonderful support group that loves me very much and they allow me my space but a lot of times I can't even talk to them about the situation because I know they can't understand um, and because it's so painful and I know sometimes me speaking about it puts my pain on other people they, they kind of internalize it um, Do you so feel like you're, uh, it's a burden for them? Sometimes, yes. And you feel that they really can't understand what you're going through? They can't, and they can't handle it. A lot of people can't handle that, the loss of a child. You know, I think that's every mother's worst sure, nightmare. Yeah. So how do you handle it? Because you are very active in the community. You're, you know, you're still going, despite <laughs> everything that you I don't you're going handle through. it so well these days.
what has helped me in the past, I try to use now. Um, I went through years of therapy when my father died. Um, I didn't want to go on medication. I think the driving force for me has been my children and wanting to be the and wanting the one thing when this happened it had the potential to to devastate my entire family right. um, because we're such a close-knit family right. we eat together we shop together we vacation together um, I had to be strong for my family so keeping them together was initially the thing that kept me together right so to say um but i found myself in a position where the hopelessness and the helplessness began to grow and get bigger and bigger and consume me um and i made a decision to seek therapy again um and right now i'm looking at the possibility of maybe i may need some medication um i really don't want to take medication but i want to get better and you know you're at that point where maybe therapy's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And then what I do is I, I you know, I went to therapy and I actually found a therapist. My insurance found a therapist um, that lost a child, which was very, very okay. beneficial for sure. me. And you know, I got to a certain point and then it's just hard enough with me trying to get through the day. Then I'm trying to make a therapy appointment. Sure. And I kind of let it go by the wayside for a while, and I haven't been in a couple months, so I did make an appointment, you know, to go back and see the therapist. And I'm going to keep my options open um, to medication because I realize I'm not doing very well right now. You know, it, it, it kind of looks okay on the outside right, right. because I'm able to hold it together to a certain extent, but it's not okay on the inside, you know, with the emotions and the thoughts and... And you know you are reaching that breaking point. Yeah, I'm I'm not my best. But right you're now. able to recognize that and Yeah. And try not to isolate and reach out and yeah. try other avenues of therapy as well. Mm -hmm. What words of advice would you have for other people suffering through this? Um, I would suggest that you seek help. That you seek help. That's been beneficial for me. Um, even when I want to isolate, even when I want to stay alone, even when I don't want to let anybody in, that's when I know I need to do it the most. Right. Um, and when I seek help, I have to allow that help to help me. Right. I can't tell help how to help me. You know, because. And not worry about feeling like a burden on others. Or not even worrying about feeling like I'm unusual or different or, right, you know, right. I don't want anybody There's to really stigma. know. Absolutely, it's a right. stigma and I don't really want anybody to know what's going on because I'll never get better Right. if I worry about that. But you work with other people yes. that are going through the same thing and that's what you would tell them. Yes. So you have to kind of keep yourself in check. Hey, this is what I tell other people that mm -hmm. I encourage them to seek help and talk about it. Yep. And, and, and another thing that I've done over the years that has helped me is I have used my personal experience to try to help other people. So even like when I decided to go to a 12 step program and choose recovery, that was very therapeutic for me because I was able to help other people through their situation. Right. Um, so that, that was very, very helpful for me. So hearing about someone else who's gone through a similar experience, you can relate. Yeah, you can relate. They know the pain that you're going through. Yeah, yeah. and it makes you feel like you're not alone. Exactly. You know, because sure. the this pe the the traumatic event and the stress associated with it can make you feel very very alone, even with other people who have experienced a similar event. You know, I went to a group for mothers who had lost children, and I thought that would make me feel better, right. but I felt that I was reliving the trauma over and over, and it just added to the stress I was already under, and right. I said, I can't do this. Right, right. Because it was making me sicker. And not everyone that goes through trauma experiences the same um, symptoms right. that you may be going through. You're, you're going through PTSD, whereas they may be grieving, right. but you're stuck in that grieving mode over and over again. Mm -hmm.
So post-traumatic stress disorder affects everyone, not only the person but their family members, and it can be difficult to break through to that person. What would you suggest to family members to reach that person that needs help? Um, when a person is isolating and they, they want you to leave them alone, don't leave them alone. Um, because that does not stop the trauma the, or the re-traumatization or right. the stress associated with it. It just makes it, it just makes it spiral out of control. A lot of times the leave me alone, I don't want to be bothered is a defense mechanism to push people away right. because of fear that they won't understand or they're going to stigmatize you or they're going to judge you right. for right. what you're going through. Um, so my suggestion, um, even to caregivers for family members that don't know what to do or caregivers caring for someone mm -hmm. with post-traumatic stress disorder I would suggest to help them get help um, if you could find a, a psychiatrist or a therapist that's willing to see the person or find a support group that the person could attend for PTSD um, so that they can be around people who are going through the same thing that they're going through so that they don't feel so alone. As far as support groups you yourself have founded and are involved in many could you share with um, the viewers? Um, yes, I actually, I created a foundation uh, after my son was murdered and we created a support group for grieving mothers, but the support group is not to relive the trauma, it's to support one another through it and to move to the next level. Um, my family is my biggest support because they support me through the worst of times. Um, also, like I said, I, I attend 12-step meetings and I have wonderful support through those 12-step meetings and I have a therapist that I go and see, that I'm going to go back and see and continue to be supported through that. So, um, different people react differently to stressors and um, some people may turn to drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, can you share us with us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I turn to alcohol initially to numb the pain. I was I was eight years old. The night my father got shot, I picked sure. up a drink. I was eight. Wow. And I wound up getting clean at 28. So we're talking about 20 years later. Yeah. And the disease, my disease of addiction had kind of spiraled out of control and I found myself in a place that I don't even know how I got there and it was so dark. And for me, um, the light at the end of the tunnel was my children because I wanted better for my children. So I got help because I wanted a better life for my children. And, and I was forced to get help because DHS came and you know, there was a threat of my children being taken away and I didn't want that. So sure. I was willing to do whatever I needed to do for that not to happen. Um, and one thing that I understand with addiction is that for someone who's using, they have to hit their own bottom, you know, and sometimes that bottom can be forced. My bottom was forced. Um, so the one suggestion I would make is if you're working with somebody who's um, self-medicating self-medicating through the trauma um, and the stress of the trauma that you can offer them help you can offer them 12-step programs you know and once the seed is planted they can't go back to not knowing right so when they're ready they know that that's a place where they can get help 